All right. Episode 7 of Shogun has now premiered, with Crimson Sky being ordered in the prior episode. The stage is now set for all-out war between Toranaga and the Council of Regents. There is a lot about this episode that I did not expect, so I am very excited to share my thoughts on it with you all. However, I also want to briefly take the time to remind you of the interview I put up last week between the actual historical advisor for the series, Frederick Cranes, and Anthony Cummins. This is a fantastic interview that gives us all a real understanding of the level of detail that went into the historical accuracy within the show. I highly recommend that you check it out if you have not already. But with that said, how do I think this episode fared? Let us dive in and discuss. And as always, there will be spoilers ahead. Episode 7 is titled, A Stick of Time. As we already know, Crimson Sky has been ordered. Toranaga is going to war. And the episode surprisingly starts us off with a flashback to Toranaga's childhood, when he would win his first ever battle. This is interesting to show because we can see in what ways the series is trying to not only stick to the real life story of Tokugawa Ieyasu while also putting their own unique spin on things. As they rightly address later in the episode and I believe in prior episodes as well, Toranaga spent much of his childhood as a political hostage to another mighty clan. The same is true in real history as Ieyasu spent time as a hostage to both the Oda and more prominently the Imagawa. Now, I believe Ieyasu did not officially fight his first battle until he was in his mid to late teens, so the version presented here in Shogun portrays him as definitely being a bit younger. On top of this though, Toranaga appears at this point to already be an independent warlord, or at least that's what it looks like. I'm not entirely sure the truth of the matter here is in this scene. Either way, I like this bit of detail, as it sets up several interesting moments within the episode that really help to build up a more interesting background for Toranaga and his character, but we'll get into that later. The scene itself is one which basically showcases the end of a battle Toranaga has won, followed by the surrender and seppuku of the enemy commander, who requests that Toranaga acts as his second, serving to strike off his head after he has thoroughly cut open his belly. And this is where the scene ends. Now coming back to the modern timeline, we begin in a forest, where everyone is waiting for the arrival of Toranaga's brother, who in the show is known as Saiki Nobutatsu. Toranaga is hoping to have his brother as an ally in the coming war, knowing that he could really use the extra manpower after the earthquake decimated his own forces. Or so we think. Nobutatsu's arrival is at first a joyous occasion, and to be honest I really like this interpretation of his character. In the book, Toranaga's brother is a bit more of a serious and gloomy figure, while here he has a very interesting personality. I also really enjoy the style of armor they gave him with a fabulous Iboshi style kabuto. Now, as the show, like the book did, every samurai lord is represented by a different color, and this is reflected by what color each soldier in that army wears as well. Toranaga is brown, while Ishido is gray. Nobutatsu here appears to be more of a silver, which you can see each of his men wearing as well. Although it's not entirely historically accurate, I don't really mind this too much, just because from a storytelling standpoint, it helps us as the audience more easily see who is who from a distance. What I did find to be a bit silly though, was that all of Nobutatsu's samurai seem to also wear a similar style of eboshi helmet as well. Although some samurai units in history were known to match the color of their armor, as we can see from groups like the E-Red Devils, who of course all wore red, I don't know much about samurai trying to match helmets. So what this looks like for me is that they just wanted to have another way we could all recognize who belonged to who at a distance. Not a major complaint, but still something I felt worth mentioning. Now, we first think that Nobutatsu is going to be on Toranaga's side, as things with him start off rather well. Yet, once we get into a banquet which is thrown for his arrival, tension starts to poke through. He tells the tale of Toranaga's first battle, like we saw in the opening. And although young Toranaga is made to look courageous there, Nobutatsu then follows this story up by telling one where Toranaga is said to have soiled his pants the moment he had to leave to become a hostage as a child. So it interestingly undercuts the idea of him being this brave child warlord. And this is where things start to take a turn. Those of us who have read the book know that, yes, Nobutatsu is already in league with the council, and instead of coming to join Toranaga, he has instead been given a seat on the council and is to deliver a request for Toranaga to come to Osaka, where he is obviously going to be apprehended and likely executed. However, he also has a note for Toranaga's son, Nagakado, as well, ordering his own seppuku in response to the death of Nebara Jozin. And what is key is that Toranaga ensures that neither of the written orders are taken by hand, 
even going so far as to yell at Nagakado to not accept the letter from Nobutatsu, instead saying that he would consider the proposal and give Nobutatsu his answer by the following evening. This is a key moment that is also brought over from the book, as Toronaga knows that by not accepting the letters by hand, he then buys himself more time. Nobutatsu though, just to ensure no chance of Toronaga escaping, has his army stationed all around Izu to block off any exit, along with ships blockading the port of Anjiro. Now the idea of gaining time is obviously a focal point for the episode, not only from Toranaga gaining time from not giving his answer to Nobutatsu, but also later from the Mama-san gaining a moment of Toranaga's time. I don't remember what the actual name of her character is, but in the book they refer to her as the Mama-san, so that's what I'll call her here. She is the owner of the tea house which employs various courtesans such as Kiku. She had requested a brief meeting with Toranaga, one which only lasted the length of a stick of time, a small burning stick that counts down so many minutes. Now her real goal is to persuade Toranaga to allow the construction of a massive district within Edo just for the purposes of tea houses like hers, which could be a center for entertainment and pleasure, organized by the formation of a proper guild. Toranaga is, of course, rather grim about this ever happening because he says his end is near. However, it is then that the Mama-san replies with perhaps the most important piece of information spoken in the entire episode. Because she, unlike anyone else, can see right through Toranaga's plan. She alludes to the fact that Toranaga has made his own garrison appear weak on purpose, as to make it so that Nobutatsu does not expect or know about Toranaga's true military strength. From this, we can gather that Toranaga has likely moved a large portion of his army into hiding. Of course, later, Toranaga does agree to the council's demands, but we can see that in doing so, he likely has a great trick up his sleeve yet to be revealed. Now, it's also here we get one more reference to the flashback, where Toranaga asks why Tora Hiromatsu, who was also present at Toranaga's first battle, did not speak up when his brother was telling the story the night before. Both of them knowing that the beheading Toranaga did to the enemy commander was not swift and was in fact a very messy affair. I believe this helps to foreshadow the fact that although victory might seem swift later on, that in fact it can also be a very bloody process. However, Toranaga's move to seemingly give in to the council comes at the dismay of all. Not just for Toranaga and Nagakado, whose own lives are on the line, but also for characters like Yabu, who although has continually been back and forth regarding who he will support, now is seemingly locked in on Toranaga's side, after the messenger he sent to the council was beheaded. This makes me wonder if Yabu will still end up betraying Toranaga after all, or if in this adaptation he will have a different fate instead. Regardless though, Nagakado still tries to take action into his own hands by attempting to assassinate Nobutatsu, something which he nearly succeeds in doing before slipping on a rock and landing on either his head or neck and therefore causing his own death. This is a massive departure from the book, because unless I somehow missed this huge moment, no, Nagakado does not die in the book or even attempt to kill his uncle. Nagakado is of course based on the real historical figure of Tokugawa Hidetada, who like Nagakado is someone who is often portrayed as brash and foolhardy, largely because during the Sekigahara conflict he tried to assault the Sanada clan's Ueda castle against his father's orders, only to fail miserably and miss the actual battle of Sekigahara, nearly dooming his father. Despite this, he would still go on to become the second shogun of the Tokugawa shogunate, in time earning his father's trust back. Yet, here in this adaptation of Shogun, Nagakado is now dead, and we really don't know what other heirs Toranaga has. In real history, Tokugawa Ieyasu had a number of sons, so losing this one wouldn't necessarily matter that much. But here in Shogun, it creates a bit of a bigger problem. We do know that he is expecting another child, but obviously we don't know if that child will be a boy. So now it seems as though if Toranaga is victorious in the end, which I think we can all assume he will be, he now might run into his own succession crisis should he not have another proper male heir. This is a very interesting change to kill off Nagakado, although I don't think it is necessarily a bad one, but I am very curious to see how it all plays out. Now the other character I really want to touch on is Blackthorn. There is a lot that happens to Blackthorn, or regarding Blackthorn in this episode. Blackthorn is straight up not having a good time. Toranaga won't let him use his ship, Yabu insults him and makes him look like a fool for not knowing how to use his own swords, Buntaro nearly kills Blackthorn only to then get a hold of himself and formally request that he be allowed to do so, 
And of course, Umi hates Blackthorn because of the night Blackthorn spent with Kiku. No one likes Blackthorn. Pretty much everyone is either really cold with him or straight up wants him dead. This is vastly different from the book, where by this point he is very friendly with Toranaga and has earned the respect of both Yabu and Omi. Omi even goes right up to Blackthorn in the book and tells him he wants to be his friend. The relationship between Buntaro and Blackthorn is perhaps the only one that is the same as it is in the book. Now I've complained about all of these differences before, and certainly I could keep making the same complaints here. I would much rather prefer if Blackthorn did have more friends and allies in Anjiro. I think it would make the story more compelling if he were not so miserable. However, at this point I don't know what else to say about it. I really don't know what direction they could be taking his character in, because it seems like right now there is nothing that connects his character to Japan. He has no friends, his romance with Mariko is at a bit of a standstill at the moment, and he does not seem to like the culture at all. So I guess at this point I'm just curious to see where they'll be taking him, because I have no clue. Maybe they will make the budding relationship he has with Mariko truly his one good connection to Japan, but who knows. Knowing her fate though, I imagine this version of Blackthorn is in for a very sad existence for the remainder of his life if they decide to have his character end up in the same place he does by the end of the book. We will just have to wait and see where this adaptation takes us. Alright, all in all, I did like this episode. I think my own enjoyment of the show is still improving because as we continue to see major departures from the book, it leads us into more speculative territory. Because of all the changes, I don't really know where this story is heading anymore, but I am quite interested to see where it all goes. Whereas from the book and from real history I previously had an idea how things were going to happen, it is this new sense of the unknown that I think is going to drive my interest forward. But what do you think? Did you enjoy this episode? Do you like the direction that the show is heading in? Do you agree or disagree with anything I said here? Let me know in the comments below. And with that said, Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most interesting.